we try and rest this somewhere? Oh man, I did not plan this out. We are, yeah, I think I'm good. I think, yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I'm resting it on a This is like crazy. <laughs> Okay. I hope you don't use your camera like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. How Hi. are you? Holly, it's so good to see you. It's so good to see you too. God damn, yes. you're beautiful. <laughs> oh my God. Um, um, we realized, I, when I talked to Ms. Sam, we realized that you guys have your uh, Black History in October. Yes, yes. We made it you we may hit you up in October again, so get ready. So okay. ours, ours is like the shortest month of the year, so that's good for America, you know how that is. February. Yeah, we're in the middle of February, uh, in February. So thank you for joining us today. I know you don't like to do interviews. I don't know why, because that's the interview face. So <laughs> there you yeah, have it. I want to say like, yeah, I don't really do Instagram lives. This is so out of my realm and comfort zone. Yeah, but... I'm, I'm doing it because you are. <laughs> well, thank you. Because you could have said no. A lot of people said no mm -hmm. because they get scared. Um, tell us about yourself and let people know who you are. The reason why I wanted to interview you, other than your work, I wanted my people in the United States to know who you were. Mm -hmm. And um, and on my and on and our podcast, we just posted your your link to your photography so your they website. can see it. Your website. Yeah. So now let them hear who you are. Who is Holly? So I'm a photographer and filmmaker from London, um, self-taught. I kind of fell into it because I was studying to be an architect and it just so happened that um, I guess maybe we can talk about this later, but to echo a lot of what we saw happening in America last year, that was kind of like how I got into photography is that there was civil unrest happening and I just so happened to be there with a camera and that kind of just brought me to here but probably like six plus years later um and I started off doing a lot of street photography um that still is like my favorite thing to do um but I guess like a lot of like work now is it's a lot of branded work it's a lot of commercial work um and yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, it used to involve travel before COVID. Right. <laughs> now I'm not traveling, so <laughs> yeah. So how did you go from architect, like when you were a little girl, I hate to use that phrase, when you, when you were younger, were you an artist? Like what made you step into this world? Because your work is so poignant mm -hmm. and so powerful. Mm -hmm. How did you develop that eye Okay, I'm here building houses and I'm an architect, and then boom, you're taking oh, these magnificent photos. <laughs> yeah, um, so I think I wanted to be an architect from like the age of seven. Uh, and maybe I can attribute that to my mom because she would work kind of central in the city, but it didn't matter what time she got off work, especially during the summer, she would like pick us up and take us around London. We would sit on a bus because she didn't drive. And I think that was kind of like a blessing because it meant that like we used London transport and we had to go through the city in order to get wherever we were going. And so like just at a very young age, even if we wasn't getting on planes, we was traveling. We was exposed to like architecture, history, like different place in the city where, I don't know if this is the same for you, but sometimes when you're from a city, you don't always explore it. You don't yeah, always, yes. and so that was a part of our summers. That was a part of like after school every day. And I think I just naturally became interested and was like, I want to design buildings. And so I went to study that at a college or what we call university. And um, long story short, I was home from um, school for the year and it was like summer. And I think I'll sleep until midday because, you know, students, we have like no concept of time. And my mum like woke me up and was like, there's a theatre um, in Tottenham, which is like North London. Uh, you should probably go and do like stage photography for them. Now, just because I was on my course, everyone had a camera. I didn't know how to like use any settings. It was just like auto click and press for when you're on like 
And while I was there, you know, taking pictures of like actors, putting on makeup or getting ready, I didn't really know what I was doing. I saw some people protesting outside because it was opposite a police station. And as I was there, I was the only person with a camera and they said, take pictures of this, this is important. Um, and so intermittently, I would go back inside, take pictures of what was happening and I'll go um, outside and what, grew to maybe 20 people with like signs, grew to 50 people, grew to 100 people, grew to enough people that they managed to block one of the most busiest roads that go out of North London towards East London and the sea. And I was like, wow, this is a big deal. Like something's happening. I didn't know the person at the time, but his name was called Mark Duggan. And he is now, you know, forever marked in history because he was shot and killed by the police. Oh, man. Um, and that's quite unusual for us because a lot of our police officers don't have don't carry guns, right? Right. And so, like, his death was a point of contention because the family at the time was like, "Why should we have to hear from the um, from the news that our son, father, friend has died? Why has no one spoke to us?" And so they were protesting. They wanted to hear from the police chief they wanted to find out what was happening they wanted to see his body they wanted to mourn death um but this thing really grew and it grew via uh, whatsapp at the time and by the evening the people had come to see the play that was happening at the theater and so that was sold out filled with like 500 people and outside was this other thing happening so that and means the theater goers had to go through the protesters but what happened was there was an intimate period there was a period in between where the family and everyone who was initially protesting actually went home because it became dark they realized no one was there to see them and they went home but other people came who maybe felt enraged or a friend had told them to come and the mood had shifted. And so the people filled the building and outside other people came. And while this play was going on, which was a Christian play about like the end times and all this stuff, outside, you know, what turned into the people protest then became Molotov cocktails flying, buildings being burned down, police cars being set alight, and a whole heap of things. Now, the press came when the buildings were burning, but I was the only one who had a camera for the build-up. So the press was more concerned about the burning buildings Not than the death of this young man. This wow. Because suffering isn't news here. That's not news. And so um, they also, so police had to try and evacuate. And my mum actually worked to help get the people safely out of the building because that was an issue. And there's like 500 people and buildings are being burnt down. And we were also locked into this building. And I remember kind of going in the direction of this like chaos and my mom like dragging me back going you're coming home <laughs> <laughs> but she contacted the bbc and said like hey we have these pictures what do you want to do and they were like no we're not interested but then what happened in part of north london ended up spreading the next day things broke out in other parts of london in west london mm -hmm. in east london and then other, other um, cities like Manchester and Liverpool, young people started to smash into buildings and take items and do whatever they want to do to the point that what started with one day ended up being over a week and the government released a national curfew. So this is very similar to what's happening right now. Mirroring what we're going through, yes. Right? And so the BBC ended up getting back in contact and was like, actually, we want the footage. Um, and then that ended up being used in a documentary of Panorama, which is like, um, uh, a, like that's by the BBC. And then um, I had shot aud video too. So audio ended up being used on like radio. And then The Guardian and other news groups across Europe ended up like buying that footage. And that wow. was- yeah, so all of that happened, which was great for me because architecture was very expensive. So it helped me to like have some funds. And then um, 
and then that was kind of like my first experience into photography so your first experience into photography got you into the guardian got BBC. you into the bbc and other major news news outlets out there yeah what happens with these people out here i need to move to london <laughs> Yeah, it was so weird. And I was so scared at the time because I didn't know who Mark Duncan was. I didn't know the background. I was like, don't put my name anywhere. Like, make it anonymous. Like, just... And so that's that's what I, I did. Um, and what happened was, say, the following year, I went back to university because my mum doesn't like quitters and I had to finish my degree. <laughs> but, then, like, um, when that time came up again, that footage would get relicensed or someone else went to see it and really good because that was like income where I learned about oh licensing this so you had a crash course in photography, photography in yeah. the business of photography yeah 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 and credit to my mom she was like the negotiator man like she yeah she did that and that kind of like taught me and I just kind of ran with it um and I'm just like a strong believer in God as well and I felt like he just filled in the gaps often like we wouldn't know what we were doing we, but it wasn't like, I guess, a straight trajectory because after I finished school, I had to go get a job, which I pretended and I was like, oh, I'm searching for a job. But really, I just met up with people on Instagram and I was taking pictures and just like living broken, happy, taking pictures. Every day. And it wasn't until an interview a few years ago that my mum actually found out that I did have a work placement that I never turned up to. Um, yeah, of course, because I wanted to take pictures. But it <laughs> And like eventually it happened, you know, like I slowly amassed the following on Instagram, like work opportunities came and it wasn't like straight, but mm -hmm. you know. Um, you were yeah. progressing, you were progressing in your career. Yeah, yeah exactly. Nice. So, so I've noticed on your site that you have a ton of places you've traveled to. Yeah. And I've seen the animals. I love animals. I've seen the rhinos, the elephants. I'm like, what? Where, where is she going? Yeah. <laughs> How did that come about? Yeah. You taking photos of your friends, you being licensed for your images, and then you're in India. Yeah. How, How? was it? Okay, so India was an interesting story simply because... <laughs> so at the time, I had just finished a campaign with Canon. And that was probably the biggest job I'd done up until then. And you know we're coming back to that, right? So okay. we're coming back to Canon. So I had done that and I was like, and now I had money. So I was like, okay. So I didn't feel like the stress of, oh my gosh, I need to hustle. But I was like, I'm young, I have some money. What do I want to do? And then um, I was, I think I went, I, my mum was watching a show on TV and it was about India. And it was a train that went through India. And I was like, this is amazing. And what was so strange was I always said, I want to go to India, but not yet. I think I should go when I'm about 22, because then I'll be able to hang it. And I don't know why 22 was always the age, but I said it for years. And I think that was the year I was turning 22 or my last year I was going to be 22. Yeah, I think, so I went in January and I think I was like 22 and that was the year I was turning 23 or something. And I went there for a month most of it was solo after that a lot of people were like should i go india as a woman no don't go solo that was insane why um, what, what was the what was the reasons why because okay so one india is the most amazing place i've ever been to that is my favorite country hands down so far i've ever been to but they have different like you know like different cultural standards and different things and like we, if you travel there solo as a woman it's just not that safe. And I experienced some of them. Oh, um, no. Like a lot of women in India have to face, but me as a foreigner who isn't white, so I'm not as respected, I'm black. There's a lot of anti-blackness that still exists. And so I'm going and I'm seen as less than often. Um, and that was really hard. Or sometimes people will prey on you because you're a single woman by yourself. And so there was a lot of that that went on. Um, and I say all that, but it's like two extremes. It's a place where you experience incredible, incredible kind of, and like the most loving people I ever met. And then the other extreme is, because it's a place with so many people, I also experience, uh, experience people who 
weren't very good and I'm staying at your hotel and you're trying to enter my room. So, yeah, not great. <laughs> but no, no, no. <laughs> I want to go to again. Um, I'm actually like earmarking a trip for next year, December. And that was probably one time where I learned so much about photography because I went with one lens, with a second-hand camera that I owned, with a second-hand lens, like a 24 mil lens, so incredibly wide. And, I, and so when I wanted intimate images, it forced me to carry my body and to do that. And that was such a good learning, you know, with, not with like a Zoom that like, but I actually had to push myself to get those pictures. And it probably was the best experience because there was no job, there was no brief. It was just me and my camera and experiencing every day. And that trip was not planned out. So I would be like, where do I want to go? And then I would plan it as I was there. Okay, tomorrow we're going. Um, and I traveled by like bus, doing six, seven hour bus rides. I traveled by train. I, like, yeah, there, it was, but it was brilliant. It was so did great. You, did you get on the, uh, the train with all the people just pile on and, and uh, oh, really? What was that like? Long distance trains where like normally tourists will like buy first class and then I didn't know. So I, and then there was like no classes. And so you're like really in the thick of it. Um, but like trains, normal short trains in India, they actually have like a women's carriage that a lot of people don't know. And so you can go on the women's carriage and you're separated from all the men and you just feel like safer, you know, sometimes it's less crowded and um, yeah. Wow, we're really learning a lot from you. In our private conversations, um, your photography brought me to tears. And I hope I don't cry now. Um, when I said to you, um, when I look at your work, um, you, you, your work has such meaning to me. And I was hoping that when I showed your work, it would have meaning to others. And you know, I do commercial work, I do commercial beauty work and fashion work. And one night on Clubhouse, I actually talked about you. We had a whole discussion about the meaning, meaning, meaningful photography. And I said to the room, I shoot pretty women with pretty makeup and pretty hair. And you're here documenting the world. And it made me feel like, what the hell am I doing? And, so I, told, and I told you I was going to bring this up. Yeah, we had this entire discussion on um, is, is your work meaningful? Is your work, you made me look at my work to say, is my work meaningful? Yeah. Because I look at your work and it's really fucking meaningful, meaningful, excuse my English. Um, what, what, what was your passion in your heart to take these particular photographs? Because, because they're so meaningful and it's so amazing and it makes me go, what the hell am I doing? Why am I wasting my time taking pretty pictures when you're out there documenting the world? You know what I mean? Well, one, I don't think your work is not meaningful. Because I think there's a place for both, right? And you're documenting the most beautiful, do you know what I mean? Like, there's a real artistry to what you do. And you talk about the fact that why you want to also photograph, because I've heard you talk about why you want to photograph well and photograph black people well, and why that's important. So I, I, I don't think your work is meaningless at all. I think there's like great meaning in what you do. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't wake up and do it, right? Um, I, I, I mean, thank you. Cause like, yeah, like when you said that, it made me scroll through and go, what's he looking at? Because sometimes like, I think people are just kind of like dismissive of our own work or not look at it reflect enough. Um, I guess for me, the long and short of it is I'm a Christian. And I think that like, we are all an expression of God. And so for me, if I'm meeting someone I'm meeting like this image of God. And also I'm, I'm in front of someone who could potentially like change the way I see life or add so much. And like so, so many times like you're seeing an image, but the image might be like, at, if it's a portrait, it might be at the end of a long conversation or there might be like something that I've seen there. And I guess also the work is just trying to communicate what I'm seeing. And my hope is that I'll always be better at that. Um, yes. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. If I, well, I, you, I told you I was going to bring it up while we were talking. I know. And, uh, 
it, it's it's still even we talked about it a few minutes ago before we even came online and I started it again and I'm laying in the room I'm like if I was your age now I think I would have done what you're doing and it would have been a different life for me because when children are young and they don't have any responsibilities there's no children there's no mortgage there's nothing tying you down the world literally becomes your oyster mm. and you can travel the world and I envy you for that because we need more men and women like you to document this stuff and it isn't let me try to say this properly it isn't all about we don't always have to see black lives matter because in this instance you documenting the whole elephant lives matter rhinos mm -hmm. lives matter and you did that in your work you have the beautiful people of color but then you had that little boy in india and then that's the next the, oh shot, my god that's yeah. a great shot and then i saw the elephants and it was like I think it's I want I want to do that. You made me want to go out there and put the beauty aside and put the fashion aside and said, This is what I want to do. So I thank you for that. Oh uh, how did you know that was you though? Because you being so young, how did you know that was oh your phone? I didn't know it was me, not at all. I went to India, but India came at the back of a, a train trip. So I was so I never enter competitions at all. And there was this thing with this uh community called Passion Passport and they said hey we've got this thing Amtrak who wants to go on a travel fellowship where you travel across the US now I'm dyslexic writing sometimes scares me and so when I write a caption that's me being vulnerable every time because I'm like reading it a million times going does this make sense but you know what I mean it's just a caption to someone else it's this big deal to me because like words aren't always Written words aren't, don't, don't always come as easy to me. And so, like, I wrote this thing, didn't let anyone check it, sent it off, never thought anything about it. And then I kept getting a call from a foreign number, and I was like, who keeps calling me? And I realised that was them saying, hey, do you want to come on this trip? It's like, in 10 days, you better get your ticket. Like, come. And so I went there, and I connected with so many artists, but it was probably the most vulnerable trip I've done with artists where people turned up and was like, my marriage is fading I'm on this trip to change my life or I fit my job I did it and there was just this sense of like when vulnerability is in a room and there are no egos you can be your best creative self and you oh can... my god yes uh, yeah yes. see why I love her well, I've been in rooms with her too I it's 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 a I always tell people like especially we've mentored a bunch of photographers and the constant fight to tell them to leave their ego at the door, leave it, it doesn't serve you at all. It actually help. it actually blocks Indus, you yeah, from you. missing some things. It blocks you from missing your blessings. It blocks your blessings every time. So when um, a bunch of the people we were teaching, they'll say, oh, well, um, you gonna let him talk to you like that? And, like, and I'm like, like what? What where, where was the conversation? You know, you're not being called out your name or disrespected. Right. It's more like sometimes you need for somebody to hear something, and and sometimes they can't hear it. Like, hi, you need to stop doing that. You know, can you stop? It's like stop doing that. Do it with your British accent. No. <laughs> <laughs> no let's hear it. Let's. Hear it. It's great. You know, like, it's no. just Elba right here. It's just Elba. <laughs> so, so tell us about how you got the Canon campaign. Um, so <laughs> it's not a good story. So, oh, that means it's a great story then. Yeah. So when I first used to start, when I first like really started taking pictures, I was the first, I, I was the last out of my friends to adopt a camera. We used to run around with an iPhone and we used to, we were like, we want to get like the best perspective of like London from all the different angles. So we would like climb things that we shouldn't have been on and like say if there was a construction site and we saw that there was a building getting built but they haven't fitted the windows yet we're not breaking in because we're not breaking into window you're not breaking in right. everything right right but we used to climb that fence and go up 40 floors set up a tripod take an image or whatever it wait was a minute. Like, wait 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 there was no elevator no if, if a building's getting built it's not, so you're walking up 40 stories. Yeah, me. And it's not like I was super <laughs> diva, like, um, yeah, 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 I used to. And, like, probably the hardest building we got into was this really, like, we used to read about it on all these, like, weird, like, blogs called Manelli and Mills. And we snuck in and it took, like, three attempts. Security caught us once. 
loads of different stuff and basically we just started scoping it out so we would watch like okay every 20 minutes the security comes round, and it was like our own mission impossible and we snuck in and i always laugh because i said the third attempt god told me to bring pl to bring wire cutters and wire cutters to get in and i was like maybe it wasn't god maybe it was we got in it was incredible and then we were wearing masks because we knew there was this asbestos got amazing images of this building it was like an old bread factory and there were like holes in the ground and all this crazy stuff and then i dusted myself off and went to church like i was a mess <laughs> <laughs> sunday i was like i've got to go to church now um but yeah canon had like researchers who they had they knew that they wanted to do this campaign on urban explorers and they had somehow found my work. And so they invited me into like the European headquarters. And I sat down with like a team of people with like a document that big of like just stuff about me. It was really weird. That's called a dossier. <laughs> they were thorough. We were, they were like, we want you to wear either of these outfits we've seen you wear from these things. And I was like, okay. Guys are like, wow. yeah. And it was good. Um, and that was it and that kind of like started the relationship for a while um you saw that i posted something from lumix so whatever we just go and keep that moving but um yeah no it was really good and for and what was the 1960 about that was they said well we want we want to also do a press event so we did a press event and then they were like well we want to do like an event with people on social media can you facilitate that so I was like okay cool and then they were like well where do you want to go and I was like well it's got to be real it's got to be authentic and so I was like let's take everyone to Manelia Mills the same building that I had like broke into right <laughs> before and then the developers who had bought it at the time they were like, oh, so how did you hear about this? So I told them the story thinking, oh my gosh, don't sue me. And they were like, we love that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like once, once you've done it, like no one cares, do they? And so like I got to bring, I think we did two events. You got to bring like, I don't know if it was like 50 or 80 people there. Everyone got to use equipment, take pictures. Um, I mean, we got to like release smoke bombs and do all these crazy stuff within the building. And it was, like yeah it was good, good. Wow. every time you speak i'm learning wow. something new about you so <laughs> i can only say wow i love your curiosity and start off there your curiosity in, in but you know what was, sorry you know what was funny about the canon thing they were like to me oh yeah you're an arab explorer by that time by the time that campaign came out i wasn't actually doing that anymore i was doing street photography and i think one thing is is that like i just basically lean into whatever I'm enjoying. But the only reason, except for portraits, was portraits I started taking because, street portraits specifically, because I knew I was rubbish at them. And now that's my favorite thing. But yeah, everything else was just, I'm leaning into the next thing I'm interested in. So by the time we had finished that project, I was already doing street photography. So when there was another campaign now, we're like, oh, we need a street photographer. And then that's how things like continued, basically. It's almost like God is leading you down a path and then the path comes to meet you. Yeah. 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 Because because what you did when you broke into the buildings, you didn't ask for permission. Those they broke. You, oh, I, I, right, right, right. As you entered these buildings creatively, <laughs> you wasn't asking for permission and you didn't even have to ask for forgiveness because they, they opened up to you once you did it once you did it yeah. because you could have easily gone to the building and say do you mind if i take shots and they would have immediately said no. no they would have said no uh -huh. oh my gosh sometimes they weren't even sometimes they were buildings manned with people but i guess that architecture thing came out because we would go to big hotels and i'll be like no there's going to be a service at, um stairs somewhere here and it would end up on a rooftop somewhere like we were a mess but it, it was great so um, your architecture lessons have come through Let's go with that. Nothing's wasted. <laughs> Nothing's wasted. But exactly. To answer your question, did I always know? No, I didn't. So like while I was in India, I think I met someone and then there was a job and they were like, oh, I think she should do that. And then say I did a job. I was in Nicaragua. And then while I was in Nicaragua, I, I ended up in London and then a guy says to me, hey, I've just... I was just the old US ambassador for Nicaragua. I saw your images. I was like, how? Well, now I'm in London. Do you want to meet up with me? Hey, 
come and do a project in America for the US Embassy. And so like everything was just like, you do one thing. I ended up in a job in Kenya. And a part of that, they said, come a week early, you can come on a safari. I was like, yeah, sure. Go to the safari, taking images of animals. I get back, a friend I haven't spoke to in five years was like, you take images of animals? I'm gonna put you on a roster to take images of elephants. And next week I was taking it. Like there was no rhythm or rhyme to this. It wasn't like deliberate. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I can't, and that's why people are like, well, how did you do it? And I'm just like, listen, I just followed what I was interested in. I leaned into that. And you meet people. Like, there was no, there was no hardcore networking. Like, there was no, you do free things and I can't sell an ebook. If I ever do, <laughs> you know it's not true. Like, listen. <laughs> I caught that. But you know what's so great? It's, um... One of the things, that, and I'm glad you're saying this stuff, when we're in some of these rooms and these workshops and stuff, everybody gets caught up in this, I need a niche, I need to do this, I need to photograph this. And we always tell them, shoot what you love, because it always it will, like, the world will blossom to you if you shoot what you love. And it always sounds like a fortune cookie, and it's like, no, 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 we're telling, we're you, telling that's, you, that's it. You have to follow what calls you. Follow what calls you, and then everything else will open up for you. And you're an absolute story of that. Absolutely. You said, I wanted to shoot architecture, you, or you wanted to get great images of London. You did it. Something opened up. You wanted to do street photography. You did it. Something opened up. You, you, wanted, to you, shoot you, portraits. you wanted to shoot portraits. Something opened up. Someone offered you a job shooting animals, and, th and just things are opening up to you. Mm -hmm. And there is no one genre that you shoot no you just go we're just waiting for you to come on our side and take work from us so we're waiting for you to do the beauty campaigns over here no what you do is your own skill i think that's one thing i need to lean into more is like um gain more studio and lighting experience because now that i do a lot of film i'm always like where's the gaffer because you realize like light is so important especially like artificial light i mean natural light yes of course but yeah it is important to know and so i'm always in awe when i hear you that's why i used to sit when i first joined clubhouse which was like early december i didn't know anyone no one from europe i knew who was on the app so i used to sit in your room and i'd listen and i'd be like cleaning my house making food and whatever and when you first heard me on stage the way you called me out so quick i was like listen i know i've just sat in the audience and i've just been listening for two weeks but <laughs> But I really like what you do. <laughs> oh my god! So, do you have um, do you have friends when you were coming up that were into photography with you, or did you make your photography friends as you went along? So, through Instagram, pretty early on, I met three guys who were all like similar ages to me, and one of them actually was in architecture too just okay. by chance and we all one by one became photographers um, <laughs> and what would happen was I would get a job and be like um can someone lend me a camera because I didn't even own one and then I'd shoot that and give it back like it was a real hustle you know uh and like yeah they're still my like day ones and I've met a ton of other people and I would say my my first experience meeting people off the internet through Instagram, New York. That was my first experience. I was in New York for a month. And so all my earliest friends were from New York. And that's why for the longest time, everyone thought I was a man from New York. And so I had to start posting pictures of myself because I'll turn up somewhere and they'll be like, oh, I thought you was a guy. And I'm like, oh, well, my name's is Holly. Yeah, but I didn't look at that. I just looked at your handle. So that was like the biggest thing. Everyone always thought I was a guy from New York. Um, so let me ask you this question. I'm glad you brought this up. So if someone was to not even know your name mm -hmm. and they look at your work, they mm -hmm. thought you were a guy. Yeah, back then they did. But now I think you see enough pictures of like, oh, there's a there, you know. No, I think at the time he said, because I said, I, I posted a picture of myself. He goes, oh, I thought it was the photographer's girlfriend. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> I was like, you know what? We will do mental gymnastics to make sure that this does not belong to a black woman. But here I am. <laughs> oh my God, that is so funny. Tell him how every time he posted, posted his work about, go ahead. Wait, which place like go every time we being black photographers, oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. we had to learn to let our work speak for itself. Yes. Like you, we didn't 
but now I feel this way. Um, a lot of people say, I don't want to be considered a black photographer. I want my work to speak for itself. And then you realize I'm black. Yeah. So sometimes if you notice, we'll post images of other people, white women, all this stuff. And, like, think we're, we're, and then they'll think we're that woman. Think, yeah, or you're white, or you're Asian. So he started or, getting a bunch of dates from guys thinking that was him in the photograph. Yeah. Oh, they were reach out to you. They were like, "Hey, what's up?" It's like, "I'm a dude. Stop talking to me." <laughs> or you know what? If they drop a little when you rent you, I'll be like, "No, here's my paper." <laughs> <laughs> it was just always creepy. Like you, the, the the introduction to. Oh, hey, what's, uh, hey, how you doing? It's like, hi. You're, you're so beautiful. You're so beautiful. I'm like, no, I'm a photographer. Stop talking to me. That's creepy. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I now put my face on there now. and So they yeah. know who we are. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's talk about that. With, the, with this being a male-dominant industry, how do you, being a woman of color, stand out? Like, what do you do to make yourself stand out? I don't know what I do to make myself stand out that's intentional. I will say one thing that I always try to do is champion and work with other women, and specifically black women, and then, you know, secondary women of colour. Um, and that's, like, really something I try to do because this industry often doesn't look like us and therefore doesn't make room for us. And so, like, I'm a champion of black women in this space. Um, but I think, listen, I've just, it's been a lot of hard work. And I think it's been opportunity and where those two collide. And so I kind of just focus on my own. And my thing is just, like, I have to make good work. That's it. I don't know if it's... And sometimes I'll say, like, I have a lot of stories where I felt like I've been, say, like, disrespected or slighted or whatever. Those things happen. Um, but I think I've always said, like, you know what? Sometimes you're hired to speak on panels and you're hired to speak on stage. And no one wants to have a story that's, like, instantly... Boom, I've never faced a struggle in my life. And so sometimes I just thank that because I'm like, you're just giving me material that when I get paid to speak, that's what I'm going to talk about. And we're going to laugh about you on stage. And that's, that's it. You know, is, is there's that. Um, yeah, that's it. Wow. Um, like when I'm surrounded by egos, because there's a lot of male egos, uh, I think one thing that's benefited me is that I'm not afraid to say, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, my, oh, first film, my first two, one was, the other one was with British Airways. I did not know how to make a film. They saw me make two, two one minute videos for myself when I was traveling and was like, oh, you're a filmmaker. Um, I was searching for, can you make a film? And I was like, ah, yeah, okay, of course I can. And then like, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I found a guy who had recently dropped out of university. We basically shot like six thing, films together. Um, and then I remember learning on the job. I think it took me, honestly, maybe 40 minutes just to learn how to import media into Premiere Pro. I was learning. It was like a baptism of fire. Um, <laughs> man, and I just kept thinking like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing. But my thing is, is that like, well, God doesn't set you up for failure. So I don't know how this is going to work out, but I already know the end steps. All I need to know is the next step, right? And then, we're and then that ended up being really good. And that kind of started my trajectory onto making films now, which is like continually a baptismal fire, to tell you the truth. Um, <laughs> It is, it is. Because whenever you, like, go up or you have bigger ideas, you're like, oh, okay, there's just more stuff I don't know. But then my thing is, instead of being like, I don't know, I have imposter syndrome, I'm like, surround yourself with people that are better than you. And mm -hmm. I choice if I get intimidated by that or I could be a sponge and just, like, take it all in, learn as much, and what took them 10 years might take you two. Right? Yes. You are amazing. Yes, yes, yes. You yes, really yes, are. Yes. So yes. what are some of the biggest lessons that you've received while you've been on this journey? Um, honestly, mm -hmm. if 
someone says what you're asking for is too hard, sometimes it's just because they don't know how to do it. Because there was times where I was paying people money to do stuff and they were telling me, oh, you can't do that, but you can do this, that's more simple. And then after the job, I'm like, let me teach myself how to do that. And I'm like, that took me half a day. <laughs> Sometimes. So let me uh, tell you something funny uh, with this one right here. Uh, the work, you'll find that the work is simple. And I said, you can't tell your clients that because, oh, yeah. because they're going to devalue your work. So let's say there's something that takes you 10 minutes to do. And let's say you gave the rate to the client, we're just playing with numbers, 10,000 pounds. For me to do this job is going to be 10,000 pounds. And you knock it out in 20 minutes. She's like, why did I just pay you 10,000 pounds? So we can't ever tell somebody it's easy because then they devalue what you're doing. So yeah, That's I um, I have a lot of skills because I come from music. Music and photography always is my thing. So they're like, can you do this? And I'll be like, oh yeah, simple. And so he'd be like, stop saying that. I'm like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, I'm sorry. So yeah, with me, I, I'm always like, all right, just tell me what you, people like to go into depth or what they want. I'm like, just no, give me and leave me alone. So um, he always say, stop saying that it's simple. So usually I just, okay, yes, I can do that. I can hand it over to you. There you Where go. it'll take me. Uh, That's good advice. <laughs> it'll take me probably like an hour so to do it. Because that person did it to you. Yeah. Think about it. Well, no, it's different because I'm already paying you your day rate. I'm asking you to do something and you're telling me, oh, that's like really difficult. No, you just didn't know how to do it. There's a difference. And that's another story. Exactly. Right, right, right. But, well, uh, and also, I think what I've learned is that it's too old, you know, like find good community and people that don't see you as competition, but you can celebrate and build each other up. Because there's times where if you find the right community, like someone had asked that on Clubhouse, like, what do you do when you're not inspired? And I said, well, one thing I found is I help other people with their projects. If my friend has a treatment and I start helping you with your treatment for a film that you're submitting or whatever it is, the fact that I'm now helping to build your thing and we're both in that creative space and you're also in the posture of serving because sometimes, you know, you have to change your posture to, to be, like, inspired um, and realise that, hey, I don't know everything or I haven't done everything or whatever it is. That, I think that's so important. Um, that's something that I've learned, like, not only to stay inspired, but to also, like, get that encouragement is, like, get a good community of people around you, you know? And do you have a good, peop do you have a good set of people around you? Yes, a majority of them are black women. It's amazing. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice, nice. It's funny because as I'm curating the, the speakers for these interviews, I got like 5,000 black men and only like four women. And it's mm -hmm. like, I keep trying to grab the women because we need to hear their story as well. I don't want to be that misogynist dude like, oh, you have 20 interviews and you have 20 males. And I didn't want that. No. So thank you for doing this because it's hard to find Black. Women, black yeah. women who want to speak. Because a lot of times they don't want to be on camera. They don't want, like you didn't want to be on camera. Yeah. So it's like, how can you, how can uh, another black female photographer get inspired if they don't see themselves? So we're trying to get them seen, but you know, so we, we want people to talk more and to be seen more. And um, it's, it's a journey, but I'm excited. I'm happy to hear your story. I'm happy to actually see her face because usually on Clubhouse, you see her voice. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. You just hear that sexy British voice. Uh -huh. <laughs> so let me ask you this. What's on the, what's on the horizon for you? Um, Like work-wise? Yeah. I mean, there's some shoots lined up. I was literally getting deliveries just before getting on here for some shoots. Um... I kind of unintentionally shot my first short film that I need to finish. Okay. That was like, ran, like, so I did not expect to do that. And I kind of just didn't realize I was doing it either. Um, I think I want to do more film. I think I want to, probably what I should do is start scanning physical film too. So we're talking about movie okay. film. And we're right. talking about film because I shoot a lot of film that I don't, do a lot with so maybe start sharing that 
maybe start actually like selling prints because I get asked about prints all the time and I just never do it. So you're just letting money just lay to the side. But you know what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no excuse for that. Yeah, no, that's true. Just because I haven't worked it out yet and I feel like I have to have my hands on everything and maybe I need to learn that I don't need to man that side of things. Someone else can. That's called um, having an agent. And learning to delegate. Yeah. And learning to delegate. Yeah, and I actually do. I'm represented now. There's, yes, I need to... Yes. Yes. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what does your mom say about this journey? Is she proud of you? Oh, yeah, she's so supportive because I think early on she just said, listen, I just want you to be happy. There's some other family who are who's still messaging me going, so when are you going to be the first architect of our family then? <laughs> It's, they, they they just don't get it i was like it's been seven years okay cool so um but no my mom is like very supportive she's like my biggest cheerleader um she's in it with me and she's always like when do i get to travel with you when is my turn to go on like some adventure so yeah um she's she's like cool yeah will you take her with you i will you know what um in september just before lockdown, so this is 2019, we like traveled the state for yeah, work, but we like saw family because we have family from all different states. Um, I'm like, my mom's like so easy to travel with. So, yeah, the day I get to like put her in, in business, the budget, in next to me, and we're like enjoying, yeah, I've, I've made it, it's good, yeah. So, what is your dream project? What does that look like? Ooh. I think it's always changing. I know a dream right now, I, and maybe it's a personal project, to be honest, okay. is I've, I've been thinking about this for years, and I wish I did it before this whole virus. Um, but when I do, it, that will be the right time. I want to go to Vietnam for probably about a minimum a month, if not two. And I want to just travel solo go like deep rice villages everything just like immerse myself eat a lot of great food take pictures <laughs> like nothing fancy um and yeah that's like been a dream for a while um yeah that's that's like a big dream and then i think like i think maybe i should like start sitting and writing and really think about like some films that i probably I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. I just need to like, yeah. Well, the way you move, God will show you. Yeah, he'll make the way for you. He's been doing it. He's been doing it so far. Yeah. So let me ask you this. You've been traveling in the world that's been dominated by white men. What do they do when they see this beautiful black woman coming to the scene? <laughs> Get a bit closer. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, it depends, honestly. Um, do you know what was the standout moment when you said that? There was one trip where our luggage didn't come and I was going to be in Zambia deep in the bush. So we were like camping, no electricity. Um, yeah, camping, no electricity in the bush for like uh, 10 days. And our luggage didn't show up. So I thankfully carried all the camera equipment with me, but I had to live with the clothes that were on my body because we were going. And I think I just managed to pick up underwear somewhere and that was it. Um, and I think I was wearing like some type of overalls or dungarees or something. And I remember them just going, I hope you won't be a diva. I hope you won't be a diva. And I was just like... Wow. Oh. Oh no, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> and what was so amazing about that was the producer that was with me, who was a white woman, was losing her mind. And I was sitting there like, <laughs> preconceived notions of who you're gonna be. And the fact that like, I don't care about the word diva, but the way you used it was as if I'm gonna be a problem. And I remember sitting at, at breakfast one day, oh well you're from london and you're black so what about that gang problem 
I don't feel so bad. I just thought it happened to us. No, I, I was... thought it happened to us. Oh, well, let me not even think what I was going to say on this live right now. <laughs> um, but I was just like, and he was just like, and I said, well, I, I don't know. But I also was thinking, are you asking me a question because you want to solve the issue? Or am I meant to know because this is the life that you think I've lived? And so I said, well, if you see gangs, gangs is another word for like family, right? And you're talking to people who have had like every youth club, every like social facility and like their whole um, communities defunded. Like literally there is no money. And I was like, and you live in Surrey, sir. You have money and you're retired. If you really care about the issue, why don't you go two times a week and set up a youth club? that would really impact the gang problem that you're seeking and that you're talking about. Because otherwise you're asking me and this just becomes lip service, you know? And what was his, re what was his response? I don't remember, but I continue to eat my eggs because this <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, um, sometimes we have to speak that way to them because they have to know. Yeah. And I want to say it's, it's willful ignorance because a lot of the issues that we go through with people who are not of our color they just don't want to learn and and or they want to argue their points it's like or they want to dismiss your experience it's like we don't want like i've always said we don't want a handout we just want to be respected on equal planes like we want to get into the heavy the the bigger magazines and stuff we're not asking for a handout we don't want to hand we don't want to hand out a work we, we want to work and present work. our work and put it up yeah. against our white counterparts and be like can we compete yeah not not to be um shoved out before even getting the opportunity merely because of our skin color yeah exactly right. show up and become a spokesperson for every person black they might have met or heard about or watched on tv when it's like but you don't have to be a spokesperson for everything to and do what? With are you a spokesperson for genocide are you a spokesperson for pillaging are you a spokesperson no you get to show up and be jerry so let me show up and be me mm. that was beautiful thank you for that we're coming, we're almost, this, was, this wasn't so painful, right? No, it was good, but you guys made me relaxing and I'm sitting on my sofa and I'm <laughs> So let me ask you this question, which we ask everybody at this point. What are three adjectives to describe yourself? That describe you and why? Um, resilient. Mm -hmm. Love as a doing word that brings people around you and brings people in. And creative and i think resilient because you can go through a lot of things and you can continue to stand and i think that's the story of many black women and many black people um and it's resilient on the big scale and on the small scale like not being fed or ruffled to the point that you feel like you have to quit right um love because i think about this book by bog goff called love does and every scratch was about what love does and how love is a doing word. It's not just a feeling or an emotion. But like, if you can love in your environment, people shouldn't just feel comfortable. They should feel included. It should want people to sit around the table. It should invite people to the table. It should tell people I'm interested and I'm going to sit down with you and listen to your story. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, creative, because I think, like we said, like, it says like we're like a reflection of God, right? We're making God's image. Well, I think the one thing that connects us to the creator is the fact that we can create. And like, that's our part of divinity. That's the, like the mantle that we wear on our shoulders. And so like to continue be, to be connected to that thing as well, you know, God. So, yeah. And now uh, this is that last question before we get to the end. For all the gearheads out there, what's in your travel bag when you shoot? For contractual reasons, <laughs> because <laughs> I'm not lying up in this place and I'm signing things that say I can't talk about things. <laughs> right. It's okay. Okay. It's That's totally okay. That's totally but okay. The only thing that I will say is actually in my bag is because it doesn't affect nobody. Hold on. Let me, let me get it. Let me get it. It seems like a big bag. Okay. 
Lovely, medium format, Mamiya. I can say that, yes. And you got the nicer lens, I'm sad. But um, yeah, about that little stuff, whoever's paying me is in my bag. Oh, who's ever paying me is in my bag. Oh my. <laughs> I fall in love with you with every sentence. Yes, Holly, one more thing. Um, Okay, we want you to have a bomb photo because sometimes we have, you know, we take screenshots and it look crazy. So we do this three second thing. We want you to hold the pose for three seconds so we can get the, the proper photo to send you. Oh, let's put as a thumbnail. So let's get together. We all come together for the thumbnail. That's perfect. I should have had that on the entire time. I don't know. You are so beautiful. Let's do this. So you ready, babe? Let's do it. And one, two, three. There you go. <laughs> it feels like we're taking an x ray when we do that. Oh my God. Holly, thank you, thank you so much. So, so much for this. So this has been amazing. And thank you for allowing us to give you your flowers. Yes. Oh, thank you. Honestly, I feel like we've like met kind of now. It's way better than oh. Finally, finally, finally. Um, That's it. We, we yeah. did a damn thing. Continue to do amazing continue, things. Continue being continue great. Continue to stride. And, and I'm so proud of you too. At this point in your journey, I can't wait to see uh, how it blossoms and how amazing you're going to be in the future. And now I'm going to throw them under the bus. If you have any questions about Premiere, oh, yeah, I can help you. This is your guy. Well, I'm there now, but back then, I mean, I've <laughs> asked the questions, to be honest. Like, I'm, I've always got questions. So, yes, I'll definitely take that up 100%. Well, thank you so much, and you have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye. I don't know how you end this. I've not done this before. I got it. I got we it. got it. We'll end this before. We'll end this before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry.